charge the people a dollar and a half just to see them. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They paid for it, I put up a parking lot. Farmer, put away the DDT now. Give me spots on my apples, or leave me the birds and the bees. Please don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They pay paradise, put up a parking lot. Late last night, I heard the screen door slam. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another webinar from our horticulture specialists at CSU Extension. Um, we just want to welcome you today. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Let's see if I can get to my next slide here. Um, just to let you know, CSU Extension is an equal opportunity access and non-discrimination university. And if you need any accommodations, if we can provide anything to you to help you learn better, just let us know. We're happy to, to try that out for you. And then if you want to learn more about CSU's principles of community or our land acknowledgement, you can do that at colostate.edu. Great. So I want to introduce our speaker today, uh, Darren Davidson. She is our sustainable landscape specialist for CSU Extension across the state. And she's going to talk to us about sustainable landscaping and why it matters. I'm also joined by Cassie Anderson in Adams County. She's going to be helping me in the background with the Q&A. Um, Darren's going to have some questions for you. You can put your answers into the chat. If you have questions for Darren, though, please put those into the Q&A, and we will try to answer those in the background. So with that, Darren, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Amy. And thanks, Cassie, for being on here. Uh, it was fun to see people um, saying hello from wherever you are. I saw somebody say that they're in Cortez. I'm going to be in Cortez uh, next week on a little road trip with my family. So anyway, it's fun to see where everybody's coming from. Um, my name is Darren Davidson. I'm the Sustainable Landscape Specialist. I've been with Extension uh, since 2014, CSU Extension since 2014. I was in Boulder County. And just last fall, I took a new position um, as the Sustainable Landscape Specialist. And so um, we're just, CSU is really, uh, you know, we always have kind of had a focus on sustainability and making the right choices and how we distribute information and help people make choices and how to manage their landscapes. Um, but this is really focusing more specifically on that. So we are going to, I have to say, this is a huge, huge, huge topic. And so what I've done is sort of broken down landscaping practices into different uh, categories, and I'm going to kind of scratch the surface on all of them, um, but it's it's a lot of information. So um, do note uh, that you will get that link to the recording if you ever want to come back and uh, revisit it and maybe catch some information that you may have missed. So I have a quick question for everybody, and if you will go to the chat where people have been saying hello and where you're from, what do you think of when you hear the term sustainability? And I'm not talking about landscape. I'm just talking sustainability generally broadly. So if you would just throw that in the chat, um, what comes to mind? Long lasting, everlasting, minimal maintenance, consistent, keeps producing, resources aren't degraded. Yeah, thriving with limited intervention. Great, okay, yes, renewable, long-term, keeping up. Great, okay, thank you everybody. These are great responses. And so um, here are a few definitions and you can find different definitions, but um, the ability to be, be, to be maintained at a certain rate or level. Focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. That is uh, one that is often used. So here's another way to think about it when we talk about sustainability. Uh, we look, there are three factors. And so we look at this dynamic balance of planet, profit, and people. Another way to think about it is environment, social, and economic factors. So where those all meet in this lovely Venn diagram is where we find sustainability. So planet, our lives and the lives of other creatures are depending on the natural environment. 
profit, you know, a sustainable landscape is going to weigh decisions according to their long-term environmental and human health and economic um, uh, means and benefits. And then uh, people, the health and well-being of the people are central to this concept of sustainability. So why, you know, the term sustainability, it's been a buzzword for quite a while, you know, well over a decade. Um, and it's, you know, some people that are saying like, well, we need to be thinking about what's after sustainability. But if we look at why we're wanting to focus on how we can manage land, how we can just go about our daily lives with future generations in mind, uh, at its core, it's we're meeting the needs again to, of today without compromising those needs. And when we're talking landscape, the design, the construction and the maintenance at any scale, whether it's a small backyard or a large commercial uh, landscape, we're going to maximize those environmental and human health benefits. And the reason this is a big deal is because we've got a lot of people on this planet. There's a lot of pressure being placed on these natural resources. I mean, you know, we just, I think it was back in November or December, we hit uh, the 8 billion people mark on the planet. And so with this rapid growth and increase in population, there's just a lot of pressure on soils, on water, and on other natural resources. And you can see that population growth is just going to increase. Um, they do think that we're going to reach a point where it'll sort of level out, but we have a lot of people that are using a lot of resources. Another key piece is that uh, in around 2008-2009, over half of the global population tipped to now be living in urban areas. So forever and ever, uh, more of the global population was in rural areas, and now we have more people in these urban areas. And so with that comes different land uses. Um, you know, in the name of <clears throat> progress and supporting people, we have to, here's downtown Denver, you know, we have to create roads and buildings and parking lots and all of these things that do support us. But we have to look at, you know, how the landscape is being altered and what impact that has on things. So those of us as gardeners can really think of ourselves as stewards of the land. So again, even if you only have a small patch of ground, if you're renting, if you just have a balcony with a patio, you can still make decisions that are going to um, you know, benefit the, the greater good and the overall landscape and the overall planet to help us achieve that sustainable goal. So next quick question, um, do you have an idea of what sustainability means as it relates specifically to landscapes? Maybe it's the same thing, maybe it's what you already put in the chat, um, but go ahead and, and add that in. Low water, native plants, and I'm reading them off in case uh, people can't see them all. Waterwise landscapes, natives, ability to maintain long term, better smart choices for plants. Yeah, this is great. Planting trees and plants that will survive without a lot of intervention, habitat. Good. Okay, so I think so far what I'm seeing, and thank you everybody for for um, putting in your responses. It's a lot of things. So a lot of times when we're, you know, when we start thinking about sustainable landscapes or how can we make better, um, oh, I like multifunctional just came in. When we're talking about landscapes, people are attracted to doing different things like xeriscape because they wanna save water and they recognize that water conservation is important or they recognize that pollinators are losing habitat. And so they wanna increase pollinator habitat. So there, those are very specific objectives. But when we're talking about sustainable landscapes, we're looking at all of that. We're taking all of those things into consideration and, and maximizing all of those things. So a sustainable landscape is one that maximizes environmental and human health benefits, again, for current and future generations. So the ultimate objective of a sustainable landscape is A, a beautiful garden. We all want that curb appeal. There's, there's benefit to you know, seeing something beautiful, to increasing property values. It's fine to also look at aesthetics. It doesn't just have to be a workhorse. But the key with that sustainable landscape is it's also a garden that protects or restores the benefits of nature or the benefits that nature provides to us every day. So it's curb appeal and it's ecological value. So for a long, long time, um, you know, horticulture and gardening was really focused on the aesthetics. 
And, you know, you can do the, the, the most beautiful uh, plant combinations and the most beautiful designs, but you can really leave out a lot of those other pieces like water conservation uh, and that sort of thing. You know, if you're planting flowers, there's a really good chance that you're going to be attracting pollinators. Uh, and I, I would say nowadays people often have that in mind, but, you know, several years ago, people weren't, wouldn't necessarily even think of that sort of mainstream that wasn't really um, a huge consideration, but the pollinators would still come. You might not be maximizing all of your floral resources for the most pollinators, but if you're planting flowers, you're probably gonna get pollinators. So a sustainable landscape, again, is gonna have all of these different things, um, gonna be thinking through all of these different things. And the key is protecting the benefits that nature provides to us. And what we mean by that, excuse me, what we mean by that are ecosystem services. So if you haven't heard of ecosystem services, this is basically, um, it's, it's not just our gardens, but it's the impact of our gardening practices and what we can, and what nature can do and how it can thrive within our urban spaces. So ecosystem services are things like pollination, pollinating our beautiful wildland flowers, pollinating food crops, uh, getting fiber, pollinating fiber to get our shirts. That is an ecosystem service. So these are things that are happening out in nature, whether we are involved or not. Beautiful outdoor spaces, uh, you know, um, health and recreational kind of opportunities, getting out, getting exercise, lowering our blood pressure, lower, lowering our stress just by being in these natural open spaces, that is an ecosystem service. And then we have things like uh, stormwater management and cleaning stormwater. Again, all of these things are happening and we get to benefit from them without even really trying. So to any type of benefit to people that can be extracted from nature. And we're not just talking extractive like, you know, uh, minerals and, and that sort of extraction, but just things that we gain from nature free of charge, basically. Some people kind of take issue with putting a dollar amount on it, but money talks and it makes it more tangible and it can really help people kind of understand like, okay, through these ecosystem services, we can have a stronger economy. We can have more diverse food products. We have advancements in medical research. So it's pretty cool when you start to really pay attention to all the things that are going on. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is sort of how how ecosystem services were defined as a thing. Um, there's a, a big UN sponsored effort to analyze the impact of human actions on ecosystems and what we gain from, from natural systems. There are over 1300 experts and scientists from all over the world and they came together and they um, kind of outlined, we've got provisioning services, regulating services, cultural and supporting services. So the ones that kind of click the most for a lot of people are things like pollination, food crops, raw materials, medicines, those sorts of things. But you can see how this wheel is broken down in supporting cultural provisioning and regulating. And that, so that's kind of this lens that we look at. So a sustainable landscape will build healthy soil, capture and clean water, mitigate urban heat island, control erosion, provide habitat, and then support us, support human health and well-being. And so these are the different categories that we're going to run through now. And I'm going to talk about how our sustainable practices can help um, foster all of these healthy systems. And, you know, the, one of the ways I think about it is if we sustain these landscapes that are out in front of our homes, they are going to sustain us. And so it's this sort of symbiotic relationship rather than, again, just looking at the single, well, I'm saving on my water bill and that's all I care about. Well, you're saving on your water bill, you're supporting songbirds and wildlife and pollinators, and you know, you're getting benefits that you don't even realize perhaps. So, so if we work from the ground up, a sustainable landscape is going to build and maintain healthy soils. So if we think about natural systems, we've got forests and prairies, soil fertility is just happening all the time. So fallen leaves and branches are decomposing into organic matter. Um, and we also, our landscapes also create that organic matter, but often we clean it up, right? A leaf falls, we rake it up and we compost it somewhere else. Hopefully we compost it. Hopefully we're not just throwing it away. 
Um, I used to work at a private estate in Loveland. This was a lifetime ago, um, but I was a horticulturist there. And we would go out when, as soon as the leaves started to fall in, you know, like mid to late September, we would go out with a vacuum and make sure that there was not a single leaf anywhere to be seen on the ground. Uh, it was an aesthetic thing. It's what they wanted. So it's what we did. We composted some, but not all. So, um, you know, just practice thinking through practices like that. So the role of soil in sustainable garden, it's going to absorb rainfall and mitigate flooding. It's going to remove pollutants. It's going to store water for plants and wildlife. It's going to provide nutrients and oxygen. It stores at atmospheric carbon, so a carbon sink. So when we're talking about climate change and all the CO2, um, a healthy soil and the right plants are really going to help sink that carbon. And then it's going to provide habitat for plants and animals. They say that soil is the largest ecosystem on the planet. We tend to think of ecosystems as, you know, rainforests or wetlands, but what's going on in our soil is absolutely remarkable. I can't really wrap my head around it. There are so many soil microorganisms, and that's what this image is showing. We've got fungi, bacteria, nematodes, microscopic insects. Uh, it's, again, the most biologically diverse habitat on the planet. And uh, they say that in one teaspoon of soil, there are more microbes than there are people on the planet. So I just referenced, we just hit the 8 billion uh, mark in global population. So we're talking one teaspoon of soil has, has more microorganisms than that. And they are helping to decompose that plant material and create substances that build uh, that glue soil particles together and build that soil. So an unsustainable practice is going to be your soil is going to be compacted. You're not really paying attention to what you're doing with it. It's being overused. A sustainable practice, you're going to have soil that's a living, healthy ecosystem. So again, we are allowing organic matter to decompose and we're just treating it in a way that really um, helps that soil thrive. We're protecting our soil with vegetation and mulch. Again, compaction is really just, compaction is awful for soil. Plants can't grow in it. It makes it tougher for the, the microbes in the soil to thrive and survive. Um, so protecting that soil from compaction. Um, the vegetation type that we choose can thrive in that soil. So a lot of uh, you, I'm sure, have heard right plant, right place. Um, it seems in a lot of conversations and presentations and things that I've been a part of recently, people are wanting to amend their soil so that they can grow certain plants, but it is much, much, much easier to choose plants that can grow in the soil that you have than it is to change the composition of your soil. Maybe you're going to amend some, you know, that's, that's reasonable, but right plant, right place is really um, choosing the plant that's going to thrive in whatever soil you have. And then there's things like garden clippings, garden waste, you're composting those, and then you're using that compost to support the soil food web and that healthy vegetation. So going back to compaction, people deal with this a lot. And here are just a few things that you can do to sort of pay attention and make sure you don't have issues with. So construction and maintenance equipment. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people like um, uh, extension, formerly agents, now extension specialists will go on site and somebody's like, oh, my, my plants just aren't growing. I don't know what's going on. And then through a series of questions, they realize, oh, yeah, we had, you know, the I don't know, we didn't had an addition on our house and the the um, construction equipment, like they drove their trucks on our yard. We didn't think about it, but they compacted that soil and now nothing is growing, nothing is flourishing. So there are things that we can do to make sure that we mitigate some of those things. Walking on and compressing or digging in soil while it's wet is uh, one that you really want to avoid, particularly this year. It took a long time before people could get out in their gardens because we had this wet soil from all the moisture. So really paying attention to soil, understanding that it's very alive and helping it thrive. So again, as I said, I'm just touching on all of these different things. But um, so a sustainable landscape can provide clean air and clean water. So plants, again, they naturally remove pollutants from the air. They take in that carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. And so um, plants and vegetation absolutely can help us clean the air and, and store carbon. 
And then clean water. I'm going to go into more detail on this, but plants and healthy soils can capture and break down and bind water pollutants. So stormwater runoff from driveways, parking lots, roads, that sort of thing. Uh, it, can, it can pick up a lot of toxins and pollutants and get pretty nasty. And then that if that water is just going right into our storm drains and back into our natural waterways, we're not you know, we're, we're kind of messing up the cycle there. So anything we can do to clean that water through our practices is great. So we can create landscapes that capture and store that water and then also clean that water. A healthy soil is like a, it's like a um, water reservoir that can help prevent flooding and also sustain that vegetation during times of drought. But again, if I back up, if we have compacted unhealthy soils, it doesn't have the ability to do all of that. So we have to, again, take all of these things into consideration and really have this holistic approach. Make sure that our soil is healthy, then it can, uh, then we get the benefits of it being able to infiltrate, hold onto that soil and help support healthy vegetation. So if we look at water, so we know planet Earth is mostly water. Um, but the, the water supply is 97% salt water, which is not usable to us. 3% is fresh water, but only about or even less than 1% of the fresh water supply is available for our consumption. Um, so we really have to be thoughtful about what we're doing with that water because that 1% is is, you know, we're not only watering our landscape and our agricultural crops, it's what we drink, it's what we bathe with, it's what we cook with. So you know, freshwater uh, city consumption rates in the eastern U.S., they say it's about 30 percent. In the western U.S., it's about 60 percent. You see different numbers, but generally speaking, we put a lot of our potable water um, onto our landscapes. Municipalities and such are, are changing to where they're using purple pipe or reclaimed water, but we still put a lot of water onto our landscape. So we want to look at water thrifty um, irrigation practices, of course, and I'm sure that you all know this, but we only want to water when the plants actually need the water. We want to choose the best time of day to irrigate, right? We don't want to be doing it in the heat of the day because that water is going to be evaporating and we want as much water as possible to be hitting the ground and benefiting the soil and the plants. Um, we've had such a wet uh, year so far, and I cannot tell you how many, it's mostly commercial, but I've seen a few home yards too. Uh, I, I've seen so many sprinklers on either in the middle of a rainstorm or right after a big rainstorm. So we really have to monitor our irrigation system, make sure that we're paying attention. And that's a pretty easy one to adjust. You know, that's a pretty easy thing to fix, just paying attention to our irrigation systems. So landscape practices that might contribute to water shortages, um, you know, like the um, Lake, is it Lake Mead or Lake Powell? Lake Mead, I think. Um, we're seeing the big bathtub ring, uh, you know, with the water going down, 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 and there, it's, it's, uh, there, it's of great concern. Granted, it's going up in this wet year, but water shortage is very real, particularly in the West. So incorrect plant selection is gonna lead to this. Wasteful, ir wasteful irrigation practices. Again, that unhealthy soil that can't hold and capture that water. Impervious surfaces, so like sidewalks, driveways, um, roads, those are impervious. They don't allow water to infiltrate. And then wasting on-site water, um, like, like uh, stormwater runoff. We just let, you know, again, I, this is a, a great year to be talking about this because well, yes, we're getting a lot of water. If that water is just running right off our site, then we're not maximizing it. And we're not, we're not allowing our garden and our yard to really use that water most efficiently and hold on to it. We might be thinking like, wow, you know, I, in my area anyway, we've gotten like 14 inches, I think, since early May, which is crazy. It's so much water. Um, but we don't want to get into the mindset of like, oh, we have this abundance, so we don't really need to pay attention. No, we still do need to pay attention because next year we might be in drought. So um, an unsustainable practice is going to be, you know, treat that stormwater as waste and quickly get it off the property. A more sustainable practice is going to use it as a resource and really manage it. So with that, we've got um, active, active rainwater harvesting. That's capturing rainwater in a container to use later. 
And then we also have passive water harvesting, and that's where we're diverting water over land for immediate use, or you can think of it as um, soil storage, and that water is being dispersed throughout the season and throughout the garden. So here's an example of a large commercial rain garden. You can see that depressed area. So it's all planted and it looks gardeny, but it's very functional in that it's capturing rainwater. Here's another commercial one. This is capturing all the water off of these parking lots. So again, instead of just going down the gutter and into the storm drain, it's going into this area that's vegetated, providing habitat, and it's gonna be cleaning that water, which is fantastic. And then also storing that water longer in the soil. Here's a little quick um, kind of visual of what you might do if you're thinking about uh, including rainwater, uh, excuse me, passive rainwater harvesting in your landscape. You've got to pay attention to where the water runs on your site. And again, perfect year for it because we're getting so much moisture. Um, I know we're hitting like almost 100 degrees now, at least along the front range, but um, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully we'll be getting water again. But basically, you just pay attention to where your water flows anyway, and then you site, you, you look for areas where maybe it's already kind of depressed or at least it runs in a general direction, and that is a great place for a rain garden. So this is what a rain garden can look like. It's going, it's, it's a constructed, it's constructed very intentionally. You do dig it out and there are calculations that you can um, use to uh, figure out how to do that. And I think our hosts can put a link in the chat with more information on how to create rain gardens. Um, but from the surface, you know, walk neighbors or from your house, it's just gonna look like a nicely planted garden, but below ground, it's doing all kinds of things. And in large part, that's because we wanna focus on native and adapted plants for rain gardens, and they have really deep roots. If you haven't seen this slide before, it's one of my favorites. So this is root systems of prairie plants. So a lot of tall grass prairie, and, and we are at the transition zone of short grass prairie in the front range, um, of course, going into foothills and, and mountains to the west of us. But anybody who's out east, you are in prairie area. And we have these plants that have these extremely long roots that hold the soil, they create porosity in the soil, and they're excellent for rain gardens. So you can see um, on the either side, you can see eight feet at the top, that's eight feet, and down below 15 feet. So for example, the one, two, three, four, fifth um, plant from the left is compass plant. Those roots can go down 15 feet. So it's going to help with erosion, it's going to help with uh, infiltration. So again, if we're looking at passive rainwater harvesting and plant selection, um, all these plants are gonna need routine water during establishment, but then you can cut off on that water. Native plants are adapted to wet and dry cycles. So they're really good choices. On the left, we've got golden columbine. In the middle, that's the native yarrow. And on the right, we have um, the native um, blanket flower, Gallardia uh, aristata. Gallardia pulchella is another, um, blanket flower species that also works, but you wanna look for plants that are touted as water wise or xeric. Here are just a few grasses that do really well in rain gardens, big blue stem, little blue stem and switchgrass. You can also incorporate woody plants. Um, a couple, So we've got do dogwood, sumac, choke cherry. Some that also do well are um, elderberry and nine bark. And again, if you look at the links or you look up how to do this, it'll kind of describe to you how you construct that and, and where you plant those. But this is an excellent way to really pay attention to the water on your site. Bioswales are another thing that you can use in your landscape. Again, this is a big one for, for demonstration. It's in the middle of, um, it's like in a road median but you can definitely do these in home landscapes too. And it's a shallow vegetated channel that's gonna slowly convey water and absorb that water into the landscape. Again, rather than just seeing it run off your site. Here are a couple more examples. Um, and I always like to, I don't know if people can see my cursor, but you know, like here, we're looking here and we see, oh yeah, it's working and all, all the vegetation, but be sure you look over here because this is just your typical you know, towards the back there, your typical median strip there with just grass. But um, a lot of people are starting to plant those median strips. Um, you could do this kind of thing. You could actually make it collect rainwater. So then we have active rainwater harvesting, and this is a whole different thing. Um, this became legal in um, 2016. 
and the law states that you can hold up to two 55 gallon barrels at any given time. Um, so 110 gallons on any residential site. HOAs can't prevent you from doing this. They can regulate how it looks or if it's in the front yard or the backyard. But, um, and again, we've got some more resources coming on this, but another way to think about water and handle water on your site. And even though I'm speaking about all of the, you know, we talked about soil, now we're talking about water. Um, but I hope that you can all hear sort of the thread that is throughout all of these and how it's all connected. And so now I'm going to attempt to play a video on gray water because this is another thing that people are looking at more and more here um, in places like Arizona and Nevada, I think Nevada, um, people use gray water a lot. And uh, I've been in conversations here in Colorado where people are looking more and more and thinking more and more about how they can use gray water. So I'm gonna play this video, hopefully it works. It's just about a minute long. Curious? Go in depth with CSU experts on the conversation. First, a conversation starter. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Starter. Gray water is the water collected in a household from fixtures like your laundry machine, hand wash sink. So sorry, y'all. Bathtubs, showers. We're working on a lot of research to better characterize microbial quality in gray water and other water sources. A homeowner can install a gray water system themselves. You can connect to your washing machine and the washing machine creates enough pressure when it discharges that you can have that go out into your yard into mulch bed systems. As cities are thinking through this, these kinds of systems are likely to become much more prevalent and at much, much larger scales as we prepare for new futures. There's more to learn from CSU and a world of experts at theconversation.com. Okay, sorry for the pauses. I was trying to look at the chat and the questions and so it took us out of YouTube and back into Zoom. Um, but there you go. So a little bit of information on the potential use of gray water. So we have to be careful. We have to use it carefully and appropriately and you need to learn all about it if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, but again, the CSU Water Center and CSU Extension has more information on that type of thing if you're curious about it. Um, here's an example. This is a garden that's entirely um, irrigated with gray water and rainwater. It's in LA, so it's a different climate than ours, clearly, um, but it can be done. You can see how the, the walkway and the sitting seating area is kind of raised up and then the, the garden is down below. That's to capture that gray water and that rainwater. Um, and there are lots of municipalities around that are starting to do more and more with rain gardens like this. Um, and then you saw those huge industrial systems with the purple pipe and, and the utilization of gray water. So again, just looking at how we can really maximize our resources. Um, water pollution is another um, thing to at least consider. So um, when we're talking about landscapes, I think most people are thinking like, okay, well, what plants should I plant? Maybe I'll get rid of my Kentucky bluegrass and, and swap it out with something native or xeric. But there are all of these different factors that are important to kind of think through, at least have in the back of your mind. Um, so again, in natural landscapes, soil and vegetation hold and clean any precipitation and stormwater. Um, but in our developed areas, a lot of this land has been paved over, and so uh, it just goes into storm drains. But um, I'm just going to go over some of the common sources of water pollution that we can kind of be thinking about. And it's one of those things. So I have a degree in horticulture from CSU, and I also have a degree in landscape architecture. Um, and after my first few studio classes in landscape architecture, I just, it was like I had a new pair of glasses on. I just saw the world with a whole new lens or through a whole new lens. And that's my hope in, in sort of scratching the surface on some of these is that you'll just think, oh, I was going to do this thing, but maybe that's not the best practice because it might be um, a source of pollution uh, or, you know, it might compact the soil, that sort of thing. So some of the more common sources of water pollution are fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides. You know, excess nutrients from runoff of fertilizer, that can cause issues. 
um, people who are not following the label on, ex on uh, pesticides, insecticides and herbicides, um, they can apply too much, they can apply it at the wrong time and it gets washed off and it goes into our waterways. So just really paying attention, not saying that you shouldn't use any of these things, but if you do, you need to be very mindful, follow the label, make sure you're doing it correctly. Animal waste. This is a big one. So um, dog waste has bacteria and high, it's high in nitrogen. And so that can really pollute waterways. So you always want to, you know, you want to pick it up in your own yard. Again, this is outside of our landscapes. But if you're on hikes, if you're on trails, you always want to pick that up because it's not only just yucky to see, but it can actually have a big impact um, on the natural systems around it. Road salts. I feel like every year extension offices get calls like, oh, you know, this tree is having these weird symptoms. And then it turns out that it was right next to where they dumped a bunch of ice melt, that sort of thing. So again, you're, you're taking care of your site, making sure that you and your family don't slip, but you have to think about what impact that might have on the landscape down the road. And then particles and fluids from automobiles. Not a lot we can do about this. But again, just something to think about. So oil, gas, brake linings, um, tire and engine wear, all of that has to go somewhere. Um, and it just kind of goes into the landscape. So if we go back to bioswales, rain gardens and other strategies, we can really use our landscapes, even in our home landscapes to clean up these things uh, and have a, a really positive impact. So sustainable gardens can also control erosion and sediment runoff. So vegetation with those deep roots are going to hold soil in place and decrease the likelihood of erosion and sediments. Um, the sediment from construction sites can be actually greater than um, agricultural sediment loss. It depends on the site. It depends on the practices. Um, but, you know, if you're having work done on your house, you really want to pay attention to that and make sure that um, sediment and erosion is is um, being handled correctly. Um, that sediment, it can cloud waterways. And then again, it's often going to carry those pollutants. So our landscapes can minimize that on site. And again, I just have to throw it in there one more time because it's so awesome um, if we're using native plants. Um, particularly native prairie plants, those are really going to hold on tight. If you're in the mountain areas, if you're on the west slope, there are also native plants that are really going to be able to help you and, and hold that soil in place and help with that infiltration. Okay, next thing a sustainable garden can do is mitigate the urban heat island. So if you're not familiar with what urban heat island is, um, it is a phenomenon where... Um, the increased demand for cooling energy in buildings accelerates because of uh, whatever the, the built environment is. So that red line represents the temperature of a given area. And you can see over a downtown, it's quite a bit higher. It's like 85 to 92. Uh, so that's seven degrees higher. And the reason for that is because in our urban environments, the sun beats down on them all day. And the, the um, buildings and the roads and everything have a high thermal mass. So they just absorb that heat all day long. And then in a natural system at night, uh, and the environment is meant to be able to cool down. But because of the high thermal mass, all of these building materials are radiating that heat back into the environment and the area isn't able to cool down. So that's what creates a, a, a high um, urban heat island um, at one time, Denver had the third highest heat island in the country. It's down now. It's not as bad. Um, but and I, I think the reason for that is because they look at the urban area as compared to the rural surrounding areas. And because we go out to just flat grass and farmland so quickly and then up into the mountains, it's a greater difference. It's a greater change. Um, but there was a 2001 article uh, in the Denver Post where the city forester, uh, Mike Swanson, said that concrete is definitely getting poured faster than we're planting trees. So again, that's just that example of we're developing our urban areas and we're not taking into consideration uh, the landscape that's being displaced. And so that's where all of us come into play and where we can really have a great impact. Um, the potential annual benefits of a tree 
Um, I love this. So parts of Colorado have uh, plenty of trees, but lots of Colorado historically did not have trees. Um, it's just not part of the ecosystem of like a short grass prairie, for example. But in our urban corridors, we created this urban canopy and this urban forest, and we gain so much benefit from these trees, particularly if we plant the right species. But you can see cooling costs up to 13% can increase your property value. Trees can be habitat for lots and lots of insects. And then also uh, intercepting uh, stormwater. So it gets captured in the canopy and then slowly uh, moves down into the ground. The trees help infiltrate. Um, and there's a, um, a resource that, again, I think our hosts are gonna put in the chat that's kind of fun to play around with. And it sort of has these different calculators of how, um, how you can, in, um, how trees can benefit your property depending on where you put them and and how you utilize them. So again, an unsustainable landscape practice is going to be one where invasive plants are they're just in the landscape. You're choosing native uh, you're choosing plants that are potentially invasive. Whereas a sustainable landscape practice, you're you're carefully selecting your vegetation. It's not going to be invasive. Um, and if you are aware of any invasive species, you're going to be removing those. So the horticulture trade, unfortunately, has introduced lots and lots of uh, species that have escaped and become invasive. Um, again, on the front range, there's one called myrtle spurge. It's a cute little plant, came from the horticulture trade. As it turns out, it's really invasive. And so now all of these communities have spurged the purge day, uh, purged the spurge days. Um, to try to get rid of it. So we just want to be thoughtful and mindful with that. Um, some people ask, you know, they they plant a native plant and it's pretty aggressive and they think, oh, well, that native plant is kind of invasive. But in fact, a native plant can never be considered invasive because the, the definition of an invasive species um, is uh, in within Colorado law. Um, and it's one that is not going to be native. So Native plants can be aggressive, but they're typically not going to threaten the local ecosystem. Um, and, you know, they're going to, they might sort of crowd things out a little bit, but they're not going to totally take over and just become a monoculture and push all of the other native plants out. So again, unsustainable practices, our landscapes are going to require lots of potable water, fertilizers, potentially pesticides. A more sustainable practice, we're going to choose plants that are adapted to the conditions of the site, um, whether that's the soil, the precipitation, the nativity, etc. That's that right plant, right place. Another sustainable landscape practice, we're going to choose a plant palette that includes plants that are both beautiful for us, so we get that curb appeal, but they're also going to serve as food or refuge and cover for wildlife and pollinators. Native plants are talked about a lot these days, which I think is great. Um, they do typically require less resources to maintain. Again, they nurture local wildlife and they also create a distinctive sense of place. And that's a piece that I really like. Um, some people are, are trying to move away from the term zero scape because it's so misunderstood and people say zero scape. Um, and it's not zero, zero escaping is just dry landscaping. It's not rocks and cactus, not zero. Um, but people are starting to use the term Colorado scape. So it's really celebrating what we have here in Colorado and, and um, using Colorado plants to give you that distinctive sense of place. Another benefit that you can get from plants is using vegetation to reduce the heating and cooling requirements of your, of your home or surrounding buildings. So residential housing takes up a lot of energy consumption, cooling costs. I mean, we've had a cool uh, spring and early summer, and now all of a sudden the furnace is flipped on and it's super hot. I'm sure far more homes are using their ACs. Um, but a properly designed landscape can reduce those energy costs. And it's just, you have to be a little bit thoughtful about where you're planting things. Do you have a windbreak to, that's gonna reduce heating costs potentially in the winter? Or do you have deciduous trees that shade during the summer and reducing your AC costs, but then they drop their leaves and then you get that solar gain in the summer. So again, use making your landscape and your site work for you is a really cool thing to be able to do. 
So again, a sustainable landscape is going to save homeowners money over the long run by minimizing water bills, heating bills, and cooling bills. Um, and here's a, a statistic that I came across. So landscaping doesn't only add beauty to your home, but it can improve your home's comfort and lower energy bills. On average, a well-designed landscape saves enough energy to pay for itself in less than eight years. So again, we're, we're moving beyond the idea of just, we just want curb appeal, we just want it to be pretty, or we just wanna save water. Um, our landscapes can do all of these things for us. Now looking at habitat. And I'm looking at our time. I need to get going as I, I'm going to I'm going to start flying through things a little bit, but I'm happy to answer questions. And then again, you'll be able to come back and revisit these slides. So if we're gardening for wildlife, we're trying to create places to, for them to hide, for them to nest and raise their young. And what we really want to think about is recreating levels, vertical layers of vegetation. So it's not just about increasing floral resources, but the vertical layers is really key. So the image on the left, you can that's kind of what we would see. The image on the right, that's maybe um, another illustration of having everything from ground covers to mid-story to up into tree canopies. So that sustainable landscape practice is going to be one that has diverse flowering native plants and communities that make up the garden. If you're really wanting to focus on um, pollinators and wildlife, you might leave a few areas of soil that are bare, not huge areas, but those areas might be used as nesting habitats or mud sources for pollinating uh, species such as butterflies or ground nesting bees. So uh, gardening for pollinators can be really fun. And, um, you know, not only is it going to be beautiful, but it's also so much fun to kind of sit back and, and watch what pollinators are visiting your garden. So it not only helps with the conservation of pollinators and plants, it also allows for that ecosystem service because we're um, helping to conserve all of these different environmental factors. So again, sort of that multi-layered approach. All right, and then where do we come into play? So we're talking about the soils and the water and the interplay of those and then um, controlling sediment and erosion, but supporting human health and well-being is a huge one, um, particularly during the pandemic, uh, you know, in those early days when we were all scared to leave our homes, the interest in gardening just absolutely shot through the roof because people realize, well, I'm stuck here, but oh, hey, I have this outdoor space that could potentially be more than just, you know, what it is now, but they could really um, engage with the, with the environment, engage with their plants, start getting more involved in it. Um, the World Health Organization defines human health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So having the physical and visual access to natural settings, um, it can support all kinds of health and well-being. Um, uh, social scientists and psychologists have found that everyday encounters with nature, just it could even it can just be green views, even if outside a window, um, it can lower our um, stress levels, it can lower our heart rate, it can um, help us feel more calm. There was a study done quite a while ago, maybe in the 60s or the 70s, where they um, learned that hospital patients who are recovering from gallbladder surgery used fewer medications and were able to leave the hospital earlier if they had a view out the window to something green versus people that had no window or a view that just went to another building. So even just that visual connection. Um, but then again, it's physical, it's exercise. You can get cardiovascular workout, you're using your muscles. Um, you can do all kinds of things to benefit yourself. Um, so again, these gardens have a whole host, a whole range of benefits to us. And then I'm quickly, we've got about 10 minutes, I'm quickly um, just going to touch on materials. So again, looking at sustainability, um, we're thinking about our plants, we're thinking about our water use, we're thinking about our soils and, and our, um, our well-being. Material use is one that kind of gets overlooked, but it's really important. So it can be a very consumptive and wasteful process. Uh, and we don't necessarily think about where our materials come from. So uh, an unsustainable landscape practice is going to, you know, the, the life cycle of the material is linear. It's the material is extracted, it's created, we use it for a while, maybe it, you know, it kind of breaks down, so we throw it away. 
that is unsustainable. Something that is more sustainable, it's circular. So the material can be reused or recycled and we're thinking about where that material comes from. So the more sustainable approach is going to be, we're using material that represent a regional identity. You know, people do that a lot with like the granite and the moss rock or the sandstone. Um, it's gonna support the local economy. And if we can reuse materials that are found on site, um, you know, somebody might be taking out a sidewalk. You don't have to throw away that concrete. You can actually reuse it in creative ways. Um, in some industry, like in, in the industry, people will call that urbanite, sidewalks, urbanite. Um, but you really can use it in some pretty constructive and creative ways. So if we're bypassing the, the um, you know, the, the further extraction and production costs, um, both environmental and um, economic costs of that, then uh, we're definitely getting into more sustainable practices there. This little picture here, this little guy, um, that's a tree stump from a tree that was cut down uh, and it was flipped upside down and now used as kind of a little play shade structure. So that's just an example um, rather than chipping it. You know, of course, that could have been chipped and used as mulch, but a lot of people would just, um, you know, have it hauled away. So thinking about how you can um, reuse materials on site. Here's another example. Um, these are window bars that were taken down. They were redoing their window bars and they stuck them in the ground and kept uh, kept their dogs out of this area. So, you know, it's kind of fun to get creative with that sort of thing. And then using minimally processed materials. So uncut stone, earth materials, wood, bamboo. Again, just thinking about the life cycle of the material, where it came from, how, how far it had to get there. Does it sort of fit the, um, the aesthetic of your site of Colorado? Does it all tie in? And so can cities save nature? Yes, I absolutely think that they can. Um, but we have to be able to see ourselves in all this work. So, you know, there's the, if you build it, they will come with pollinators and wildlife. But we have to have this, we kind of have to have a, a, an adaptive approach. So, you know, we can't just say on this date, I mow and trim the hedges or I mow the lawn every whatever, once a week, or I water this frequently. We have to be able to really, um, we make a plan, we implement it, and then we have to monitor it. We have to pay attention to how it's working, how it's going, and then evaluate it and then make adjustments. So I think more and more people are starting to monitor things, especially in their home gardens, because, you know, you have it right there. You planted that plant. Okay, how's it doing? It's growing well or it's not growing well. Don't be afraid to change things out and adjust. Um, that's a really important piece of an adaptive um, management framework. And that can apply large scale, home garden, whatever. So you have to be able to learn the landscape. Um, if you're using native plants, they don't always necessarily look good right away. Uh, so you can plant some things that grow quickly and look pretty right away. But once a landscape is really thriving, um, people like neighbors and passersby, they're going to connect and engage, and then they're going to get really curious and they're going to want to know what you're up to. And then they might be open to trying new things. And, you know, we all start to understand the ecological function and the ecological value more. Um, and it's it's a very connecting thing and it's a very positive thing for, you know, again, that financial, the social and the environmental um, pieces. I like to point to this um, example. This is a commercial landscape, but it's the High Line in New York City. I don't know if anybody has been there. Um, but it was an abandoned raised railway uh, that it, it just was, you know, nothing was being used there. Um, and these designers decided that they were gonna tackle it and they created this park. And there, there's, I think like over a mile of walking paths and benches, and they've introduced all of these native plant gardens. So they've increased biodiversity. People say that they love going there. They take their lunch walks there when they didn't used to leave their office before. So it's had this huge positive impact, um, you know, right in the middle of New York City. And so I think that we can all definitely do that in our own landscapes, in our own spaces. And we just want to think about how that connects to the to the larger environment. It's, it's not necessarily just our little plot of land, but we our practices can um, be more sustainable and more um, 
more sort of in tune, in harmony with with the larger landscape and the larger environment. So um, I love this this uh, quote from e e Aldo Leopold. He says, we abuse the land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. But when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And I think that's so true. Once we once we start to understand it more, then we just sort of, it it all kind of falls in line more easily. Uh, and then finally, I'm just going to quickly introduce a new program that CSU Extension has. It's called Landscape for Life. It was developed by the uh, Botanic Garden in Austin, Texas, and the U.S. Botanic Garden in D.C. Um, and it's all about sustainable landscaping practices. So um, it goes beyond just basic horticulture, um, but there are hands-on activities, and you learn a whole host of things. We're going to be launching that um, either later this year or early 2024. So if that's of interest to you to kind of dive deeper into some of this subject matter, um, then be on the lookout for that. And again, it's really looking at the impact of our practices and not just water conservation, not just pollinators, not just native plants, but that holistic kind of framework and view. So with that, I am done. And I know we just have a few uh, minutes for questions if there are any. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. That was mm -hmm. tons of good information. Um, if anybody has any questions, now would be a good time to pop those into the q and um, We answered some as you were talking. Let me see if I can pull any of those up and see if, um, if there's anything that you might have some more. Uh, I will on. say, um, you know, people maybe not have this question, but there's so much interest and um, uh, so many questions about Re turf replacement right now because there are all these um, initiatives and you know people can get rebates and things for removing turf um, and that is certainly part of this puzzle um, you know it, it nothing says that you have to remove turf to have a sustainable landscape but it's the whole picture like do you only have turf and you know no floral resources for pollinators or if you do have turf, are you actually providing the right amount of water? A lot of people overwater their turf grass. And so that's a really easy fix. That goes back to where I was talking about irrigation systems and having those in tune and um, uh, really paying attention to those, right? So that's, that's a very easy way to uh, save water is just, if you do have turf, that's okay. It's your choice, um, but uh, make sure you're watering it the right amount. We don't need to overwater, so. Right. Tur turf is just it's you know it's it's people are so curious about what they should be doing with it right now so I thought I'd throw that out yeah good good point um we did have somebody asking about turf and and, and they have dogs and so one sure. of the things that we always talk about with a lot of these low water grasses or these natives it's oftentimes they don't take the traffic so well um but right. Cassie put a really good recommendation in the chat there's a new one out called Tahoma mm. 31 it is not a native, it is a Bermuda grass, um, but it is a low water, cool season adapted native or uh, um, turf grass. So something to think about. That's called Tahoma 31. Um, any, any, I don't know if you covered this, I, I, I might've missed it, but any plants that you recommend that would do really well, native plants in clay soil? I did not cover that. Um, that's where I think you need to look, go go to CSU Extension. Maybe we have time to pop that in. But we have yeah. tons of plant lists. I mean, you know, we could list off, you know, four or five or six from the top of our head. But um, the CSU Extension, if you go to the publications tab on our main website, we have lots and lots of fact sheets um, with great plant lists that are, we have xeric plants, we have all native plants, and it'll talk about, um, uh, different, um, you know, soil types that are necessary. We also have programs like Plant Select. They're going to highlight different um, plants where they, you know, what kind of soil types they can use. So there are a lot of great resources. And I think it would be better to get a big picture of that rather than us just listing off, you know, a, a handful. Yes. Great, uh, great advice there. I did just pop into the chat um, a link to the native herbaceous perennial stack sheet awesome. that we have doesn't cover specifically soil type, um, but in mm. the comments for each plant, um, sometimes it'll say if it's, it's you know, if it says well-drained soils, obviously that's not clay. Not clay. Right. Um, I think Utah State has some good mm. resources on plant, all kinds of plants that do well in clay soils, and they're mm. similar to us. So I would um, 
maybe think about looking at Utah State as well. Um, let's see. Uh, we, I think we covered most everything else uh, in the Q&A. There's still a couple of open questions. Let me look at. Um, I think these are more just comments. So great. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've covered everything. Any last thoughts, Darren? Okay. No last thoughts. I hope that, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, it's 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 less um, a gardening how-to concept and more a how do we look at our gardening practices and what kind of impact um, are our gardening practices having. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us, hanging out with us over your lunch hour. And great. Hope you have a great afternoon.